So welcome everyone to the Open Active Adoption Engagement Forum for Monday, the 23rd of September uh, to 2024. And um, thank you everyone for, for joining. Uh, I'll just start with the quick usual reminder. I think everyone on the, on the call is very familiar with this uh, already, but just in case there's anybody catching up on the recording on uh, YouTube that is new to Open Active, then please do join our Open Active Slack workspace. Um, the links there and if you're watching the recording uh, there'll be a, a link through to these slides which you, you can click through and find all these links there um it's a great place to sort of keep in touch with all the latest uh goings on in open active um and also uh collaborate and communicate with other people in the community and um, so yeah if you're new to open active please do join us there uh Got a few things on the agenda today. We have Zach, who's kindly joined us from London Sports, who's going to be giving a bit of an update on some of the work that they've been doing. Um, we've also got Ursula uh, here today, um, uh, who's part of the ODI team. Uh, she has worked on Open Active uh, in previous spaces and, and then gone away and, and recently um, joined again. So she's going to be um, facilitating a, a session on user journeys. Um, and then uh, we've also got a quick update on um, a change we recently made to the Open Active website on the Find a Partner page um, to help people find uh, suppliers and other people offering Open Active services in the, in the community. Um, so, yeah, that's what we've got on the agenda today. I'll start with the usual quick round of introductions um, just so uh, everybody can kind of get to know the others on the call. Um, so, Jules, I'll come to you first. Uh, hi, yes, I'm uh, Jules from Yorkshire Port Foundation. I've been in comms with us since before Twitter. Brilliant. <laughs> Thanks, Jules. Uh, David? Hi, I'm the Head of Communications at the ODI um, and work on um, bits and bobs around Open Active, so glad to see everyone on here. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Uh, Yasmin? Hi, I'm Yasmin. I'm Everyday Active Officer at Active Kent and Medway, and I work on our Activity Finder. Thank you. Uh, Ursula. Good morning all. I'm Ursula Marco, Head of Product and Innovation in the ODI. Okay, thanks Ursula. Uh, Darren? Hi, I'm Darren. I'm a technologist at the ODI, um, focusing on data on Open Active. Thanks Darren. Uh, Tom? Hey everyone. Uh, I'm Tom, co-founder of a company called Played, which supplies activity finders that use open data. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. And Zach. If you're there. Good morning, everyone. Afternoon, rather. Um, I'm Zach. I work as project manager in digital tech and innovation at London Sport. Great. Thank you very much, Zach. And I suppose I, I think I left myself out. So um, my name is Tim Corby and I'm a uh, engagement consultant at the Open Data Institute. Um, chair of these adoption engagement forum meetings. Brilliant. Um, thanks very much, everyone. Um, I didn't have these items in, in particular uh, order, but I, I thought we'd start with you, Zach, uh, if that's OK. So um, yeah, over to you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, firstly, apologies. My camera doesn't seem to be working, so I'm off camera at the moment. Um, so I just want to give a quick update in regards to some of the work that we've been doing at London Sports. I'll start off with the club data work. And uh, so we were commissioned by the GLA last year, September last year, to map the spread of community clubs across London. Um, and we are basically at a point where we're delivering this project. Uh, it's coming to an end at the end of this month, and we're handing in the final report to the GLA at the end of this month. Um, and so far, it's been a very successful project. We've been able to engage with over 100 organizations, um, be it NGPs, local authorities, and some strategic partners as well, and to be able to gather as much data as possible. Uh, the way we went about this project is initially we created a sort of a club standard template for data collection purposes so that we can collect um, the data in the same format. And we tried to keep the fields as similar to Open Active as possible um, so that the data sets can correlate with one another. Uh, we had some difficulties with engagement initially. It was quite difficult to get people to upload their data on the spreadsheet in the format that we requested. And so there was a lot of manual admin work to be done in regard to that as well. Uh, but eventually we got there and we were able to sort of map the spread of community clubs. I can't unfortunately go into too much detail at the moment in terms of the numbers and figures. Um, but once we do submit the report to the GLA, we would all we will also uh, submit a report to yourselves that, that you can share with the network as well, um, which will sort of go into more detail around how many clubs are 
in London overall and as well as a breakdown per boroughs. Um, in the future, we're looking to use this data set for some internal insight purposes as well. We know that this data set can be overlaid with other data sets, such as just giving data set or demographic info to be able to get a further understanding of um, clubs in London and the, their surrounding um, demographics and so on and so forth. Um, and that information will hopefully be quite valuable to us internally in terms of what projects we'd like to do at London Sport, but also externally for NGBs and local authority, authorities. We feel as if this sort of uh, accumulation of data sets overlaid on top of one another will be quite useful as well. And so that's pretty much the, the club data work. Um, I can give a rough number of the amount of clubs that we have in London, which is around around 6,000 clubs. Um, but the more sort of succinct figures will come will come at the later date once we've submitted the report to the GLA. And the other piece of work that we've been engaged in is to be able to make open active uh, data open referral compliance. And um, we basically undertook this work from, from Open Sessions, which is the activity uploader that London Sport have. Uh, and we've been able to make Open Sessions data open referral compliant. The idea now is to be able to test the efficacy of this um, with either a social prescribing platform um, or in partnership with, with other active partnerships as well to be able to test this outside of London. So we're in conversations to see whether there's any of any interest from other active partnerships to be able to test out this data set uh, within a social prescribing platform to be able to understand sort of differences and nuances between London and other areas of the UK as well. Um, but overall, just to understand better data and insight in terms of whether this combined data set of open referral and open active make social prescribers' life easier in terms of referring people into physical activity. Uh, London Sport had conduct conducted a study in 2021, which talked about the lack of physical activity data in an open referral setting and in the social prescribing setting. And so one of the ways to combat this is, uh, from our perspective, is to be able to combine open active and open referral data um, and to be able to then put it on the social platform and, and understand whether that has any sort of impact in terms of how many uh, socially prescribed physical activities there are. So we'll be hopefully running a pilot with a social prescribing platform in London to be able to test this out. This pilot will run for, for a period of three months. We're still in discussions in terms of who would be best to partner with from a social prescribing perspective, um, but hopefully sort of beginning quarter of next year, we should have something in place in regards to that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for me in terms of, in terms of updates. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Zach. That, that's really interesting. I think um, both um, projects that London Sport have been working on are, are really good. Um, I will open the floor now. I can see authors uh, raised their hand with a, a question. Um, so yeah, any any other questions as well? Um, but I wonder quickly, just before uh, coming to Orsula, if um, you didn't mind, Zach, just for anyone who's not familiar, um, just talking a little bit about who the GLA are uh, and um, you know the, the work in it a bit more of that kind of context because uh, there's probably someone some on the call or, or watching the recording that might not be familiar with with the GLA and, and who they are and, and what this where this work is going absolutely Tim uh, it's a good point uh, I should have I should have caught on to that earlier um the GLA is basically Greater London Authority um so they they operate in London um and they're the ones who funded us for this for this program in terms of being able to map this project community clubs this is basically part of what's called the Civic Data Innovation Challenge Fund, for which there were several projects. And the point of this is to be able to add to a Civic Strength Index, which was created by the GLA alongside the Young Foundation. Um, and basically, this Civic Strength Index uh, scores boroughs by a score of one to five, based on a number of factors. And one of these factors in the future will now be club data as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Zach. Uh, Ursula. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, I've got a question on the social prescribing pilot. How, to what extent will the pilot measure uh, the full cycle? So obviously the data that is been, or the, phys the data that goes into the social prescribing system um, that um, health workers can then use to suggest people or point people to specific activities, which people, not which people, but how many people take up those activities and 
kind of demonstrated that closed loop because that's something that we had been discussing internally and it would be really useful to know how well does open active fit the use case of social prescribing that's a really good question thank you um i think from our perspective what we'd like to do is in the first instance is measure the baseline amount of physical activity available on the platform versus the amount of physical activity available once um once that's been ingested and following that, we'd also like to know the conversion rate of how many people who are referred into physical activity actually undertake physical activity as well. And um, the ideal is that we'd like to partner with a social prescribing platform who could provide us with also of KPIs because those are key in terms of demonstrating the impact of this. Um, the reality as well is that even though there might be an increased amount of physical activity opportunities, it could be a scenario whereby social prescribers still don't socially prescribe people into physical activity and because of a lack of trust of, of these activities and so on and so forth. And that's where the the data and insight will be quite quite useful for us to understand. Uh, from the study that we did in 2021, another part of the issue um, alongside the lack of physical activity data was that uh, social prescribers would like to know how trusted an organization is before referring people into it. And so they would have to like to have some kind of links with that organization beforehand which obviously open active does not necessarily solve as an issue. So it'd be interesting to see um, the conversion rate of how many people are socially prescribed to physical activity and the experience of link workers in regard to that as well. Something that London Sport are thinking about in the future, which is still in discussion, is um, somewhat of a club mark sort of mechanism, um, whereby clubs are sort of marked based off of the information that they provide. So if they have a DBS checks and all sort of government governance documents and so on and so forth, we could potentially add a club mark to that, which would then add some validity to the data and maybe allow social prescribers to have a better understanding of where they should refer people into. But we would probably look into that a little bit further once we get the data and insight back um, in regards to this project. Brilliant, thank you, Zach. Uh, Jules. Are you there? Sorry, just to write down my questions as I go. Uh, Zach, are you, Cross-referencing this with active places power. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, no, not to my knowledge, Jules. Okay, because that's uh, probably one of the biggest databases of leisure things out there. And Sport England are very much up on it. They presented at, uh, at this a couple of months ago, and it was a uh, they have a, a site ID reference that right the, time... I, the place ID reference. Yeah. That might be something that if you want to build on data that's already there. That's absolutely uh, a good. I, I like the idea of the organization you can find up. We've had one for about 12 or so years that we collated and we shared. We use that as a backbone for our CRM and newsletter things. But uh, what, what finder are you going to be using for the ORUK? Uh, so for now, we don't have any plans on, on creating a club finder per se. Our main intention with this was really to be able to refer this data back into the GLA system, which is the Civic Strength Index, for them to add this as an indicator of civic strength in terms of the club data. Um, in the future, we, we're still looking to see what we're going to be doing with the data set itself. For now, our main plan is to use it for data and insight purposes internally and externally, and whether a club finder will be happening in the future or not is something that, that remains to be seen. So how will social prescribers find it through the GLC uh, database? So the social prescribing uh, project is a different different project entirely. And the social prescribing project is basically combining open active data and open referral data um, and making open active into an open referral compliant format so that it could then be ingested by uh, social prescribing platforms. And then basically that data set would appear on a social prescribing platform. Bob, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jules. Uh, Tom. Hello. Sorry, I've got a bit of a dodgy internet connection, so if it cuts out, that'll be why. Um, cheers for that, Zach. I think we've discussed this in the past and doing a bit of work around that. What was the, um, I guess, when you were getting hold of the club data in London, where did you start? Like, where was the kind of first port of call in terms of finding what clubs existed was there an existing database that you added to or did you just start from scratch because there's seems to be a lot of work happening like from both sides where there's kind of listing stuff in 
online and then people being able to access it from the bottom up. And then there's kind of top down NGBs, for example, who have a database of all the clubs in their sport um, and which trying to understand the best way of kind of minimizing effort of small organizations, which I do think there's a it's just difficult task for them to, to keep listing stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is really a difficult task for small organizations to, to keep on top of. And the, the approach that we took initially was to engage with the larger organizations first and foremost. And we targeted NGBs and local authorities as well as strategic partners first. Um, we took about six months to engage uh, in totality with all of these organizations. So even with larger organizations, the engagement efforts are are quite difficult, um, to be completely honest. We then mapped that against open active data and deduped it from, from all of open active data um, based off of the clubs that we have in open active. And that's the sort of, that's the sort of approach we took. And is the definition of a club a physical location? Is it, does it have to have a physical location or is it more of the club in terms of the organizer rather than the location? Which I think is where Jules touched on before about active places which is very much about the location, uh, a physical location, opposed to the club being an organizer, which is a confusing sentiment, I think. Yeah, it really is. And it's a really good question, Tom. Um, initially, we sort of went back and forth with that in terms of what we would define a club as. We quickly realized that clubs operate under multiple addresses. So it could be that mm -hmm. a club has a main address, but they also run sessions in three or four different addresses. And so we, we took the definition of club to be more of an organizer um, and a specific place where physical activity is occurring as well. And how, how many of these clubs had a website, for example, or a social media page? I can't go into the specificities in terms of the stats at the moment, but um, I would say probably over 50% had a URL. And if we include social media pages, it's probably about 70, 70 odd percent of clubs which had a, a social media page or URL. Okay, cool. That's helpful. Nice. Great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and thanks, Zach. Uh, just one, one very quick one uh, for me, just and then we can move on to um, Orsler, um, so we don't run out of time. But um, I was wondering, uh, you said the club work was linked to the GLA and you, and you received um, funding through a, um, a grant for that. I was just wondering if the social prescribing work is supported through um, a sort of grant or funding or external funding pot, or if that's just been done through the London Sport, sort of your own resources. Yeah, at the moment, we, we have no funding for that. Um, it's something that we're looking to explore in the future. Uh, but first, run a pilot to see the sort of data and insight that we can gather from the pilot, see how uh, useful this data set actually is. And um, if we do see value and use cases to it, we probably will be looking for funding to explore that further. The reality is, is that from our side as well, we have costs in regards to sort of server and maintenance of the data set and so on and so forth. Um, so to minimize some of those costs of uh, sort of funding to explore this project on a longer term and a larger scale would definitely be something that we're looking to explore. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Zach. And yeah, definitely keen to uh, keep in touch with you um, and uh, yeah, keep involved with that work. Um, so yeah, thanks very much again, Zach, for presenting. Uh, and next up we have Ursula. So if I can come to come to you next. Yeah, absolutely. Hello again, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to share with you a work in progress on user journeys. Part of this phase, one of the pieces of work that we committed to do was to make different users of Open Active's life easier. Uh, which means looking at the current user journeys for the different user groups and how we can improve it. So what I'm sharing today is um, the map of the two, two users two, or two user groups. And I want to get in particular your input, feedback, ideas on the suggestions for improvement. Um, there are other user groups that um, we won't be able to go into today, but um, perhaps Tim, we can cover in the next um, engagement groups. And uh, you can give me also feedback on uh, the format of gathering feedback. So for next time, if there is anything that we can improve, I can take that into consideration. Um, Tim, can I share a screen? Is that okay if I share the screen? Yeah, yeah, that should be fine. Uh, let me know if you can't, but I think okay. you, you should be able to. Hmm. I don't see the usual share screen button. Um, Is this something that you need to enable me to do? Uh, 
it says all participants can share, so it mm -hmm. should, should be an option. Uh, it's just a big, big green button for me at the bottom. I don't know if it'd be I can see. Uh, it's because I collapsed it. Yes, that's it. Cool. I made it so small that it wasn't showing. Bear with me when I use the. Um, I'll be sharing mirror board. I don't know if you're familiar with the tool. Um, it just allows me to share more than what would fit in a in a slide deck. And sometimes when I share that, it's quite slow. All right. <clears throat> Let me see if you can see the screen. Yeah, it's uh, just loaded yes. up for me. <laughs> Great, fantastic. So I want to start with the definition of the user groups. You probably are very familiar with that, but just so that we are on the same page when I will refer to, to them. So the different user groups for Open Active at a macro level are data publishers. So that includes activity uh, providers such as leisure operators, commercial retailers, but also smaller uh, activity providers, whether they're charity, not for profits, clubs, community groups, they would all fit into the data publishers. So people that have activities. Um, second is the data users. So uh, organizations that have a um, platform, app, service, product, where they showcase the um, activities um, that are available. That includes uh, NGBs, active partnerships, or campaigns. And by the way, this might be because they are macro categories and groups, they might not include every single detailed um, type of user, but um, for the for, for simplicity, um, bucketing them um, so that it's the, the list is not super long. Then we've got enablers, and under enablers are all the organizations that make the process of publishing data or using data uh, possible. That obviously includes system providers, large and small, but also software development agency, because oftentimes the providers of activities or the data users might not have technical team in-house. So they will either contract the work or uh, work in partnership with um, a technical team of house. Um, and then we've got influencers. So those are groups or organizations or companies that are, uh, they have an interest in making open active work. And so they might have leverage uh, with either data publisher, data users in order to um, either make them aware of open active or uh, demand or um, suggest that organizations join. And they often also act as translators of the benefits because they know the end user much better than um, us or the initiative in general at a centralized level could, could know or even are aware of who those users are. And then finally, uh, at a... Um, higher level, uh, more strategic policy and strategy makers. Those are organizations that are the player role in the space while not necessarily being directly implementers. So there won't be data publisher, there won't be data users, but they might have an interest in uh, open active working. Um, this does not include Sport England as it, it is kind of a, a, a it's a default and, and an obvious, but um, if we were to put them somewhere, they would probably fit in the last um, in the last group. Today, I'm going to run you through the uh, the user journey of data publisher and data users, and then maybe next time we can um, we can uh, or in the next time so we can follow the the others. Uh, in a way, the data publisher and data users are the more homogenous groups because they do a similar, they have similar goals. For enablers, influencers, and policy makers, uh, it, it's a little bit more nuanced. So I will also have to think about whether this format um, could fit them. But um, from a from a uh, work package goal for the initiative. We have committed, obviously, to improve the, um, uh, the, the UX 
for data publisher and data users in particular. That's not to say that the others can't play a role, but the main goal is for those two. All right, so I'm going to start with the data publishers. Uh, you probably see the text really small, and I reassure you, you don't have to read through it. Um, but I wanted to give you an overview about the whole um, the whole map, and then we're going to dive into specifics of it. Um, before we uh, we go into the detail, um, I would I want to kind of highlight what are the phases, what are the steps of the journeys from knowing nothing about Open Active to being a uh, a date an active data publisher and, and i'm gonna switch back and forth between this the map and the website because i want to show you in some cases what is the status quo and why do we feel that um, there are opportunity for improvement uh, so the different stages for or the goals the different steps in the journey of a data publisher are starting from the I'm absolutely unaware of Open Active, understanding what Open Active is, understand if and how it can benefit me, uh, decide if I want to join. We're moving into the activation, the aware, sorry, the aware um, stage. But the first step is to decide where I want to join. And then assuming that the answer is yes, I do want to join, is building a plan to implement Open Active. And then the engage stage um, is formed by the stage where you actually implement Open Active, um, and then the maintenance. So you've implemented it, you have published your data feeds, um, and then the maintenance. Any questions at this point? And by the way, feel free, because I don't, I only see the very small pictures of you. So feel free to unmute and just step in if you have questions or comments and uh, as I go along, because we will be covering quite a bit. So if you keep it for the end, till the end, we might lose the chain of uh, of thoughts. Any questions at this point? Does it make sense? Okay, cool. Okay, so if we then go now into the, the website, I'm gonna move this up. You're probably all familiar, but I think it's a good refresher. The main the website is the main um, is the main window for Open Active. It is not the ex the the only one, because they they could be that people get to know Open Active in other ways um, at events or um, they see some materials on social media. But after the first search, they probably land on the website. Now, what's interesting about the how people land on the website unless they are directly pointed to it there is the likelihood that they will stump upon the website through search is very little unless they know what they're looking for so actually if i go back i took a screenshot of um i did some uh, some tests about the things the kind of things that people might search that data publishers might search and open active only started to pop up and not even as the first um as the first result when we are mentioning data so how to get more people to be active using data that using data is kind of like the trigger for uh for search to actually think about okay i need to show up and active um and i, I think this is interesting because um we might be we might be have we might have an opportunity in how do we improve seo for searches that aren't necessarily including data but where data and open active could be an answer so this is one of the first areas but then let's assume that people somehow do land on the website we've got a um a series of information and as a general thing one of the one of the kind of high level reflections on the website is that it has everything it's just sometimes really difficult to find it or or to know where to look so when people land on the website they might not necessarily know what open active is so they kind of scroll and there is a lot of content about the initiative its impact and so on but there is definitely room for improvement in qualifying the type of audience so getting someone that is a potential data publisher to immediately identify somewhere on the on the landing page 
So on the home page to know, oh, that is me. Let me click there. Because at the moment, it's a lot about the initiative rather than making it customer centric or user centric. So you'll see that um, as one of the um, one of the recommendations. When we then go into the publishing your data, so we're qualifying that this is the relevant area. Um, again, it has the information is just a little bit hidden because in order to get to the, the description of um, what it can do for you and how it can help you, you have to click a couple of times and there is a lot of interesting content, but it might also become noise for someone that is entirely new. Because people then have to scroll up to ready to take the next step, show me how, and then they get actually the first meaty uh, content where they can actually see what are the steps. So let's move back now to our mirror board where I will um, summarize some of the um, some of the suggestions for recommendations. So um, in the last, so in this area, which is the opportunities, you'll see um, this kind of highlights of the bordering in, in, in red. And those are uh, describing the areas that have the greatest potential because it's not very well served at the moment. Um, interestingly, I think we're doing pretty well at the general level. So the opening, what is open active? How does it help? Um, uh, how does it work? I think there is still improvement in potentially in the SEOs that I mentioned, but overall people can find the information and, and they might be, we might be able to tweak, but um, broadly is there. When we move into the understand how it, it can benefit me, this is where we can start to actually add more value because at the moment, the information is not laid out in a way that makes it very clear what is the benefit to an organization. And I think we can, we can uh, do a better job in being more specific, for example, about the tangible benefits um, or the giving some, use, some visibility of potential data users so that as a data publisher, you would understand where would your data land or potentially land and what is the potential return that you can get now we're all aware of the challenge of that closed loop because the initiative is decentralized and there is not a lot of control of that but i think now we have enough critical maps and case studies to be able to provide examples of that so that rather than letting it, um, leaving it to the potential data publisher to figure that out that I actually can, uh, can get a sense of it. Um, something that we can simplify um, is the not needing one-on-one -on -one engagement at this stage, uh, where our engagement team is very approachable and very, uh, um, and very uh, available to help, but I think the goal is to make at least up to this unaware stage uh, everything available on the website so that someone can have all the information they need to make a judgment call whether they want to explore further. And at this stage, the primary audience is very likely a non technical one. Now, when we move to unaware, you see the, the, the bordering as uh, thicker because I think this is a stage that we're not actually serving uh, pretty much at all on on the website because we we jump from telling what people telling people what open active is to this is how you implement it but I think these two stages so the deciding whether you want to join and building a plan are really key to make people to 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 make people first. Uh, helping people through the decision and helping people through the planning. And I think it would be interesting to see whether improving these two stages actually converts more people. So on the deciding if I want to join, I think we can improve, um, create a, a clear list of resources and time needed to implement. So, okay, I want to implement what are the things that I need to do in practical terms, how much time roughly would it require for who 
and how much budget do I need? And again, this is something that would have, wouldn't have been possible maybe years ago because we didn't have a lot of that uh, qualitative data. But I think now that we do, we can aggregate the data coming from existing data publishers to be able to build a picture and help potential new publishers to get a sense of what's needed, what are the things that, what are the steps and so on. And maybe help people quickly understand how ready are they to, to join through a, an easy traffic light system where they would, we would ask them specific questions and then saying, okay, you are very ready because you've got all your ducks in a row versus you, you need to do some work hands also maybe you need more resources more budget more time um, that should help people on the next step which is building a plan and again here i think we can help on one hand reduce the different clicks and different informations that people need to go through in order to sorry <coughs> in order to know what they need to do to implement but also give them some templates, plans and roadmaps to make their life building a plan easier. And then when we go into implementation of Open Active, here we can add some value, but the, the, the Delta will be different because we're pretty, pretty well equipped already with different guidance and toolings. So I think here the job is more um, helping uh, in creating checklists or things that kind of help people stay on track and not lose time or focus. And then finally, the last stage, which is the maintenance of Open Active. Um, we've got lots of different forums and options for people to stay engaged if they go beyond the, I'm just publishing data, not interested in the initiative uh, more, more broadly. Um, so we, we kind of can signpost them into the different forums, whether it's a steering group, the engagement group, the W3C community, depending on where their interest lies. And as the initiative will go into um, a different um, a different steering and stewardship of it, it can also provide some uh, um, some some links to that. So those are kind of like the areas that um, I think we can improve in the journeys. Before I move on to the user, uh, the data users, any thoughts, any feedback? Does this make sense? Have I forgotten anything? Yeah, it looks interesting. I'm just a wondering about the process of working out of quickly identifying what people want from it because all the people will deal with will either want to share information or publish it and getting them as quick as they can to work out how they can do it is it how do you can do it as a as a theoretical level so I, i'm not ready to to make the decision what i want to but i want to understand the full picture is that what you mean are you muted I've been thinking about chatbots and how we can use those to direct people to the site because everyone's got a different we've all we've just built a new website and it's bigger than anticipated as usual but everyone has got a certain through line through the story and quickly finding out right do you want to share or do you want to find activities very quickly get people into the right atmosphere of understanding what they can find yeah, yeah, totally. This is a, this is my thinking. And I've also been thinking, haven't shared it with our, our tag team. We can also do some experiments with user AI. Um, so definitely keen, Darren, to, to explore this further and, and just think about a little bit outside the box of how we're currently funneling people, which is very, very much, this is the journey that we tell you to go through rather than maybe having something more dynamic. Any other thoughts or reflections? Yeah, also, I'm just wondering what the what is is the next step of this to then update the website with the results of this. Um, the next step will be to validate uh, the these assumptions. So talk to a couple of actual data publishers um, and say, you know, how much of this makes sense? Because obviously this group is very is very broad. There are different users but a little bit more focused um, feedback. 
is useful. Once we validated that those things are actually useful, build a roadmap, which one are, can move the needle the most. Um, and then based on that, depending on which one those are, if they do relate to the journey on the website, the content, the copy, then yes. Um, but it might be that uh, some are actually uh, documentations or guidance that might be linked on, web on the website, but saved somewhere else. Yeah, because I, I remember we did a bit of work um, to sort of simplify the user journeys maybe about a year ago, um, because I think it was, a, it was even more convoluted to, to get to the place you need. But one thing we didn't do was put in any new content. Um, and, and what, what I'm taking away from what you're going through is actually there's probably there's probably a couple of steps that that could be clearer in there. Um, so yeah, as I mean, like I said, we, we simplified the journeys before, but we didn't actually generate any newer content with it. So it probably could do with a bit of a refresh, but yeah, that was interesting listening to it. Yeah. And probably simplification. I think a lot of the content is there. It just needs to be, um, streamlined and simplified a little bit more. And in some cases it's, it's about, you know, checklists or, um, you know, summaries, but again, this is something where we potentially could use AI, right. To build something. So it doesn't necessarily have to be done in a linear way. Cool. Um, any other comment, feedback? No? Okay, I'm gonna move on to the data users. So this should take less time because, you know, it's a similar, um, a similar sorry, so slow, the scrolling. Um, it's a similar process, the same, same map or same uh, fields in the map. Um, the different steps are again same to substitute the publishing of data with using of data. Obviously, there is a main difference in um, in that data publishers often need support, or most of the times need support from a system provider in order to publish. Whereas data users tend to be a little bit more, uh, let's say, independent. Once they decide to act, they can go if they have a technical team pretty much on their own, if they don't have a technical team, but at that point they would have committed to a budget, they can commission the work and it's relatively straightforward. Not to say easy, but the steps in order to get there are a little bit easier. And the certainty of the impact is also easier because they have control over the data feeds that they input um, and the customers, users at the end of, whatever, if they have a, an app or a platform or a, an activity finder, um, they, uh, they mobilize. They might not track that, but at least they know who they are. No surprisingly though, the steps that we're serving the least are similar in particularly that deciding if I want to join. But if we take it in a more linear way and we start from, the the beginning um the beginning of the journey is very similar because understanding about open active and the um the open active website showing or improving seo so the, the open active website shows when people search for things that aren't necessarily data related can still is still um is still the same uh, if we're moving into the space where people want to understand the benefits to them, I think here there is a, um, a kind of common ground around better visibility about better search and filtering essentially of the data feeds. Uh, so that as a data potential data users, I can immediately get a very clear picture about what are the data feeds that are relevant to me, what's the volume, what's the how much can I rely on them for my user needs? Do I need to have something in real time or not? Um, how much uh, variety or frequency of activities does, does my customer base or my user base need and so on? So that ability to search so that I immediately can understand what is the benefit for me and deciding if I want to join. So in these two blocks, uh, the main activity would be improve the uh, searchability of our data feeds and the dashboard, which I don't know if we actually have launched it, but if we have, it's just been launched. So it's, it's still, uh, it's still um, 
you know, it, it, in its infancy and we can definitely improve it. The goal here is for a potential data users to immediately know which data feed can I into are relevant to me because of the uh, because of the criteria that I have. And again, here we could e explore the use of AI because the criteria that, um, and requirements that a data user have might be different from from another. When we move into the building and implementing open active, this is where um, we can help with a, some templates and some probably some checklists so that people have a an easier way to build a plan. We do have a little bit of a step by step guide, but at the moment it points to one on one engagement to better understand different steps. And I think we can streamline that so that people are independent into creating their own plan, but we, they don't have to start from scratch every time. Um, and then I think we're pretty good on the implementation of Open Active. Our developers site and documentation is very detailed. And as I said, once people know which data sets they need to integrate and assuming that the data quality is up, up to the standard that is required, it, it is very easy for a or possible for a data users to work independently. And we still have ability for them to engage uh, with uh, our technical team and our engagement team. Now, when we go into the maintenance of Open Active, I think here it would be probably useful to create better feedback loops. And by that, I mean two things. One is the ability to measure impact. Data users are better placed than data publishers to be able to provide that closed loop. So how many active, how many people that were pinpoint that they were pinned an activity or shown an activity have actually taken that? Not, not entirely easy because again, they might have an activity providers, sorry, an, uh, an activity finder. So they're not the one actually uh, measuring that. But I think through things like page views and clicks, so we can probably get it, start to get a better picture. Um, and, and on the other hand, because they have access to, um, to the data, uh, data, uh, pr data providers, particularly user, the small users, like a, a, a club or a community centers or a, or a person that, that uh, provides an activity, um, they can, they're much better place to um, help create case studies and so create that impact uh, picture. Um, in order to make that life easier, we can probably come up at this point with templates for that and maybe ask people some questions that will help us monitor the impact or then monitor the impact in a better way so they actually see tangible aspects. And then finally, because the assumption that a assuming that a data user is gaining some value from being part of open active, they might want to expand and scale. And so creating an easier way for requesting data that they know would be um, would be useful because they might know that actually their user base is interested in specific locations or activities or a uh, type of activities for sp specific um, communities, having a, an easier way for them to say, well, if you had activity, activity providers, if you publish data about this, we'd be able to integrate because we have a user base that is ready to, to take up that, creating that or starting to create that closed loop. It's an assumption we would have to test it, but I think at this point we have enough um, enough data and critical mass in order to to be able to know that potentially this can generate positive value for for the initiative and for data users um, as well. So those are kind of like some of the priority areas. There is a lot more in this, um, and if you're interested in getting access to this or a copy of this, so that you can look into the different steps and. Uh, uh, either add anything or query anything, um, please let us know. We can make this available probably in a, in a way that is, um, that is uh, easier to navigate because it's, you know, you can access it directly. 
Um, but I thought that for today, it was important to focus more on the what we think are the opportunities. Any comments on these aspects? Uh, yeah, I'll just um, make a small comment, Oslo. Uh, firstly, thanks for, for the presentation. There's a lot of um, detailed content there. Um, I think as well as content though, on that point, and you've touched on it a few times as well, um, structure is like really, really key, I think, on a website. As you mentioned, just like reduce the number of clicks, reduce the uh, duplication, because uh, we found like on, on sites, as uh, any kind of site, I think, that exists for a number of years tends to go through a number of owners and so on and so forth. People kind of come through and not necessarily reinvent the wheel, but you can have certain layers of varnish, let's say, that which are put on, which kind of obfuscate or or hide things or, um, you know, replicate them elsewhere. So that kind of consolidation effort, I think, is key. Um that we can actually do on the open active website before even possibly considering like a full reboot, uh, which we've mentioned uh, a couple of times before to just strip back down from scratch and say, okay, what would we do from like a blank canvas point of view? Um, so yeah, structure. I've mentioned this uh, a few times before already and I just wanted to put that in again. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad that, um, we're going in the same direction. Um, and I think we are starting to see with the, you know, the, the work that you're doing on um, making it easier for non-technical people, people that aren't uh, developers to publish data, uh, those are all things that I think go in the same direction, which is let's have a very user-centric approach. And if I was to summarize, what is the work that we're doing is trying to be as user-centric as, um, as possible, because if it's not easy, people will likely not prioritize or do it. And it might be that even when it's easy, there will be other blockers, but we won't know what they are unless we simplify things first. Great, thank you. So as I mentioned, this is the first stage. Um, if you think that something like this is useful to hear, um, please let Tim know, and we will cover the other use cases in one of the next meetings. Um, if you have suggestions for improvements or want to access again, um, let us know. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Ursula. And yeah, if, if anyone um, has any thoughts or anything that they, they want to send through, then please do get in touch um, by email or Slack or, or wherever, um, and we'll be happy to uh, to talk you through it. Um, brilliant. Uh, if you don't mind stopping your sharing, Ursula, um, although if just I that, share, it might, uh, it might override you anyway. Yeah. Sorry, I was just taking forever to go on to this. That's fine. Um, so yeah, just very quickly in the last couple of minutes, uh, I just as some of you may have seen this already, uh, but I just wanted to highlight and showcase um, uh, some updates that uh, mainly Howard has been doing. So a shout out to Howard at the ODI uh, for some of the work he's been doing to to update this page. Um, and this is the kind of marketplace or find a partner page or or whatever you want to call it. It's gone through various iterations. Um, so if you go to the Open Active website, you'll see this find an Open Active Partner link. Uh, hopefully you can see my mouse uh, highlighting that at the top of the screen. Um, and if you click that, you'll come to this page. Um, and it's basically a revamped uh, marketplace or, or place where suppliers of Open Active services um, can list themselves. Uh, and hopefully the work we've done um, and that Howard's done will help. Uh, organizations who are looking for a partner or an organization that provides services to be able to find them more easily. Um, you'll see we have these uh, filters at the top of the page, which you can select, which um, narrows down which providers are shown. Um, and it's a, a much more sort of simplified um, version uh, where there's a, simply a logo, uh, the name of the provider and a link through to their website. A short description and then we've now also added um some uh, an option for each organization to add a kind of example link or case study or something that can kind of showcase um some of the work that work that they do um so yeah there's uh, there's not too much to go into there um if you uh, have a look at it and, and if you have any feedback or, or thoughts on how it looks or how it works then then please do let us know um 
it's uh, simple for organizations that have a service and aren't listed to to um, to add themselves. They just simply get in touch with us via email um, and we send them a um, a link to this Google form, um, which just has, is a, a kind of short, quick and simple Google form to, to fill out and um, which uh, helps them to to kind of list what to, as, exactly what services they are they are offering to the to the community. Um, and and some links and logos and things like that. So yeah, that that's sort of just a very very quick uh, uh, run through. Uh, as I say, if anyone has any questions or, or has a look there and has any feedback or thoughts on that, then then please do let us know. And with that, we kind of got to the end of time. Um, if anyone has any very very quick last words they would like to to add, then uh, oh Jules. Thought you might want uh, to do it. This is nothing relevant, but uh, I've learned the sign language for life, that, which is very good for Zoom calls. So you can just do that rather than having to go do that or anything else. I'm trying to make it a new thing. You're the first people I've told. <laughs> Brilliant. Very good. I like it. We can we can uh, add that to the uh, to the AF uh, as a uh, as a new thing. Um, cool. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Uh, great to see you all. And uh, yeah, sorry for the the slight change in the uh, in the schedule. Um, should be back to the kind of regularly scheduled programming from <laughs> from now on. So we'll have a, a W three C community group. Um, not this week, but the, the following Wednesday, and then back to the AEF again. Uh, two weeks after that, I think it's Wednesday sixteenth of October is the, is the next one. So, yep. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining, and uh, take care, and hope to see you all again soon. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye.